next speaker, Arjan Doorland, who is the Executive Vice President Technical and Competitive IT for Royal Shell, joined Shell in 1987. Prior to that, worked in various project management roles with Fokker Aircraft and Exxon, moved to his current position in 2006, and as VP and CIO downstream, based in London, he holds global accountability for all IT within the Shell downstream organization. Arjen was named CIO of the year, you might remember, in the year 2009 here in the Netherlands. Mr. Dorland, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, <laughs> thanks. Actually, your bio is all data, because I moved on from London back to the Netherlands, and I'm, in the terms of George, the BT manager of Shell, because we have split BT and IT, and I will talk a little bit about why we did that and how it's working. I will also talk a little bit about big data, information, and analytics. So let's now look at technology and the economy in action. So, in Shell, in 2010, we have redefined competition. In the past, it was all the other oil and gas companies, obviously. But at certain states, we said it's also technology companies. Because if our technology is not as good as the top of the industry, why would national oil companies, who are the resource holders, want to work with us? They can work with someone else. And we are winning deals because our technology is at the forefront. So technology and technology-driven innovation, where IT uh, plays a key role, is absolutely key for our competitive position. And that then led to the creation of this business technology unit called Technical and Competitive IT. And I will explain how that sits next to IT and R&D. OK. so. Why is it so important, technology? Well, a recent study of uh, McKinsey revealed that, out of 700 companies, revealed that the only way big companies can make a difference in the future is compete on technology. So George is right. It's about the ability to create technology, the ability to create software. Because population will grow. There's more energy needed than ever. Even if you max out on renewables, we still need also more hydrocarbons. We also need more gas, we need more oil. So, so to order to fulfill that, we have a tremendous technology challenge. We are in a technology race. Because these new hydrocarbons are not in easy locations. They're in the Gulf of Mexico, two, three miles deep. And we have to drill at that level. And if you make a mistake, then you know what happens. So you have to really be careful, and there's a lot of technology needed there. Or they're in Sakhalin, where you have to all your own, own channels, or in other difficult locations. So these pieces are needing a lot of technology to make that happen. So when we look at this whole value chain of an oil and gas company, it starts with uh, trying to find oil with exploration. I'll talk about that a little bit. It's a big data explosion. Then you have to drill. Then you have to build your production facilities. Then you bring, have to bring it onshore, refine it, bring it to the customer. So this story is also about the customer in the end. But before we can bring our product to the customer, it has to go through a lot of technology cycles. So what are the challenges here? There are many, many challenges uh, ahead of us. One is integration. In the past, you had these islands of technology, and it all worked on its own. But today, it's all a global integration between customers, between suppliers, between technology companies. The infrastructure getting more complex. Um, the, the markets are more volatile for a trading business. And then, obviously, uh, the margins are also very tight. People don't really understand how competitive the refining world is. And in the last quarter, every oil company made losses in refining because the margins are zero to negative. So what allows us to deliver this? Well, Shell is a big company and sometimes the largest company on the planet with, with this big revenue. But the reason I show this is Technology and innovation for us is not just something which is really nice in the lab or works in head office. Innovation in our technology has to have scalability and has to work all over the planet in very difficult conditions, in head office, in deep water, and wherever we want to go. So that puts a big challenge on our technology as well. It's not just having nice innovation somewhere in the lab. It's about scalability. It's about work, working in difficult circumstances all over the world. So how do we tackle this? First of all, of course, it's about technical innovation. The things we're doing in gas to liquid is quite unique in the industry. That's a big uh, plant in Qatar we built in five years. It's the size of the city of Amsterdam within the single. 
and that was in the middle of a desert. Um, then it's our floating LNG, which you might have heard of, where we put a big LNG plant on top of a 600 meter long vessel. To, to create that, you have a design office in New Orleans, which is ours, and in The Hague. Then Technip in Paris. The hull is being built in Korea. The rest is being built in Perth in Australia, where the vessel will go to. That has to seamlessly work together. That's one of these integrations you'll see across the planet. Sharing data, sharing information, real time, and working around the clock. And then the last piece is about talent. When I get the question, what technology is next for you? I said, give me first more talent. Because without talent, without the human side of things, which was a little missing in the story so far, it's not going to happen. And you all know as CIOs, if you don't have the right people, you're not very successful in the long run. You might get some of the technology done, but is it really supporting the business? You need to have the talent who can bridge. Bridge the gap between what the business really needs and the technology and then you can make it work. So, this is what we did in 2010. We had research doing great things, but research people never think life cycle of, of a service or a product. They just move on to the next bright idea. They, go, they throw some big algorithms over the fence to the business, in our case, seismic, and then, okay, sort it out. They don't think about IT security, they don't think about scalability, they don't think about data management. So there was a bit of a gap. And on the other side, IT in Shell in those days was very busy with big SAP, the, the regular infrastructure, uh, the desktop, the data centers, outsourcing, all the good things a, a good IT department does. But our board felt there was a gap between. And that's when they created global competitive and technical IT, which I'm heading, which in, probably you might see as BT. But it's not BT against IT. It's BT and IT. I tried to bridge the gap between R&D and technology and IT. And my business unit has people from IT, and I'm coming from IT as well, because as said in the introduction, I used to be the CIO of Downstream before this position. But half of my team comes from the business, comes from technology. They are geoscientists, they are engineers, geophysicists, mathematicians a lot, because we do a lot of model development and so forth as well. And through that, we try to bridge the gap between R&D and technology and IT. But I operationalize nearly everything through IT these days. Nearly everything we do on R&D ends up as an IT service, an IT product, or an IT something, because it's all based on big data, models, whatever. When we are searching for a new catalyst, 80% of the work is just models on computers trying to mimic the molecules, and the last 20% is, is real wet lab chemicals. That's completely different from 10 years ago or 20 years ago. We even in the other side of the river in Amsterdam, we used to have a big facility with test plans and whatever. We don't need to build it anymore. It's all computer modeling. Now, a few examples in action of, for instance, big data. So this is just a high-speed data storage, and you see an explosion. Why? We want to see more, and we can see more. It's like the medical industry. When you shoot an MRI of a human body, we shoot an MRI of the subsurface. Try to do the same. Get this big picture, and, and what you see in the background is, is then our visualization room where people can walk through their reservoirs. And for some people, this is modern art, and for other people, explorers get very excited when they see these red blobs uh, because that might indicate there is hydrocarbons there. But we have a data explosion because the sensors are getting better, and a lot of those technologies come from other places. Most of the sensors we're using in deep water now, they came originally from the printing industry, but they're so good. You see this crossover? also between the stacks in the, in, in the technology from printing to all of a sudden deep water survey. Interesting. So these things are happening as well. But the high speed storage and the seismic data set growth is phenomenal. And you see a factor 100 there easily. And this is one of our big data challenges. It's uh, integration as well. You hear a lot about big data and, and analytics. But visualization on top of that is a bit undergunned. And that's absolutely key. Because without visualization, a lot of that big data doesn't make any sense. So again, you see some pictures of what we're visualizing there. And for the specialist, this, this is really important to see the geological structures and then decide where to drill. Because drilling a uh, proper well in the Gulf costs a few hundred million. So you better do a lot of IT analysis before you really drill. Otherwise, if you drill in the wrong spot, you, you waste a lot of money. So one of these things in action, big data, analytics, high performance computing, and then, and then visualization. Another one really key is integration in, in, the, in the technology chain. So we are investing between 25 and 30 billion every year, every year, 
on new facilities. That's our lifeblood. And in the past, we had engineering contractors, we had suppliers, we had our own engineering uh, and design officers, and they were all working to different data standards, to different uh, structures. And then there was a lot of exchange and, and rejigging of data. And, and, and engineering contractors loved that because their business model is billable hours, so they didn't mind, but we did. So we've now said, this is our data standard, because it's not just big data, it's also about having a corporate data model, really key. So it's a revival of the whole data management and data modeling as well underneath this. And now we can connect engineering contractors, suppliers, our own design officers, and whoever else is involved in such project. I just talked about floating LNG, worked from Paris, New Orleans, The Hague, and Perth. And we have many more of these projects where where you work around the globe, you have to share data and information because the whole design process of a technical facility is just data, 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 refined every time, more precise. Drawings are also data. Everything is data in the end of the day. So the way we are treating this now is quite novel in the industry. We are changing the game here and we have, have an integration across many, many parties now working. 4D modeling is another one. Yeah, you all know 3D modeling, but 4D modeling means you have a time axis. So you know, and if you just put RFID tags on every part you get in, and when you have to start to build a new platform in the Gulf, then you know where you are, what you can assemble, what you cannot assemble, because this part is coming late. We had our latest Olympus platform, which is just about to go on stream, had delays because some of the special products had to come from Japan, and there was just an earthquake, and that cost a few months on, on the timeline. And we had another I think a typhoon hitting somewhere, and that also delayed some of the, the steel work. But when you have this whole model, where you can just go through 3D to 4D, and then 5D, the connection to the, your part supply chain, then you can really, really manage these big projects in a better way. And time is money in all of this. So, so we are really moving from 3D to 4D to 5D now, real quick. Another example is in the maintenance space. Some of you in the more industrial area understand sensors everywhere these days. You want to just keep your facilities running. Predictive maintenance. Three pictures here. The middle one is our control center of the Gulf in New Orleans. In the past, when there was a hurricane warning, we had to evacuate the platforms, shut down production, and then, and then after 20 days or so, you could re restart. We have put a, a cable, a, 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 a cable in the Gulf, uh, fiber optic connecting all the platforms. Now, when we have to take the staff off because of warning, we can still keep producing from the center of New Orleans. Only at a certain wave length or a certain, certain uh, wind strength, we shut down. So that saves us a lot of production in the end of the day. So we can take over everything from New Orleans and run all these platforms in the Gulf uh, as if they were manned. The top one is the Groningen gas field, where we have these big compressors. Um, uh, coming from, uh, from Siemens uh, with their own software integrated with an uh, with a analytic solution to really optimize production there. The bottom one is, I think, from uh, Salim in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Siberia, which is one of the production fields we have there. And the beauty of all of this is we have now remote diagnostic centers where people can just watch from remote what's going on there, but also think about, okay, we have that spare part there, this is about maybe to break down in the next 10 days. How can we get the spare part over before it really happens? Again, big data, analytics, and visualization in action. Another one touched upon already, a uh, changing transport environment. Gas for, uh, for shipping instead of this, this heavy bunker oil is a far new, uh, new idea. The full fuel mix change has been the electric cars, hybrid cars, fueled cars, whatever. And then the whole connected car concept, which is interesting uh, concept as well. Still a big fight around who owns the data. Is this the owner of the car? Is this the manufacturer of the car? Is this the, the company who provides uh, the traffic services? Is this the energy company, be it the oil company, be it the electricity company? There's a lot happening around that one and a lot to come in the future. All in the end of the day to provide a neatest and seamless experience to the customer. So here's where the customer comes in. And more of that customer in our retail, world, we have 10 million customers a day. And until recently, we didn't keep a lot of data on those 10 million customers a day, but now we do. And we are also looking at the web, at all the, uh, all the social media, and we are also feeding back into the social media to create a seamless experience for the customer, but also to create a loyal customer. Because if you 
low down on our app on your smartphone and you want to have these offers, because it's all what you want, or maybe you don't want it, but if you want it, you get these, those offers and, and there's the response to these personalized loyalty offerings is much higher than to the general loyalty offerings. So, so this whole big data, big data mining, analytics, and then and, and focusing really and trying to wrap around the customer is really important for us because we have a very difficult product. You don't want to touch our product normally. If you do, <laughs> something went wrong with fueling and you have to clean your hands. Huh? You, you don't want to smell it, you don't want to see it. You just trust that there's someone coming out of, uh, out of the pump into your car. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very strange proposition when you think about it because we cannot compete as such on the appeal of the product or the design of the product or we can only uh, compete on the presumed quality of the product and, 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 and what people think about that. It's, it's a different concept, but still, we try to lock in the customer and, and provide services through mobile services uh, and it's just not w where people can go, where we can find us, loyalty offerings and other ways we, we reach out to the customer through the, through the mobile world. So, so it's really adding value to the bottom line. Again, all these examples show how the economy and technology are getting completely interwoven and how companies like Shell, but probably most of your companies will increasingly have to compete on technology. Technology wrapped around the customer, but in our case also technology wrapped around our big production facilities and, and, and the, the, the race to find more energy for, and create more energy for the world. So how do we do that? Because we might be a big company, but you can't do this alone. So, so we do a couple of things. First, we have a couple of these R&D and, and, and business technology centers across the globe, as you see them here. Um, because you need the knowledge everywhere, but also the talent is everywhere. So we're searching east and we're searching west to create a good talent base. But then we have four ways to go to the market. So in, in to deal with R&D and new technology. One is really proprietary R&D. And in some cases, like our subservice software, our interpretation, our modeling, it's so key for competitiveness. We completely keep that in-house, do it our own people. It's, it's a really key, key piece of technology and software. But in the most cases, we're happy to co-innovate with the industry. And I will give a few examples in a minute. Because you cannot go it alone. Our R&D budget is, is a few billion, but if you look at the IT, and technology companies we're working with, their collective R&D budget is more than 40 billion a year. If we can tap into that research and development, if we can then direct some of that research and development to our, towards our needs and be an early adapter and an early mover, then you create a competitive edge because you hardly ever can create a competitive edge forever. It's, it's always a factor of time and then someone else catches up or there's something new coming. Then we outsource a lot of our R&D as well to, to third parties, to research centers, uh, to universities. Happy to do so. And also you get a lot of good ideas and talent and new ideas coming in from that as well. And again, it's all about speed and being early adapter. So this is what we call our ecosystem for my BT lens, but partly overlapping with the, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, IT function, obviously. So yes, we are a big SAP user, but yes, we also do some co-innovation with SAP. Same is true for, uh, for Microsoft, the same is true for Cisco. We, Cisco has been quite instrumental in helping us to automate our drilling, allow more remote operations there. Um, and now it's working with us on a solution to uh, safeguard and, and make secure our process control systems because that's also now big on the agenda, obviously. There's something, uh, something a step up is needed in that world as well. And there are many more names, smaller and larger companies on this, on this map and, and more to come. It's really about an ecosystem. We also get them together and we also get them to work together. Sometimes we're just saying we need you and we need you and we need you to work together with us on a solution. And then we are not after our own intellectual property. We're happy to share them because we want to be an early mover and then an industry solution in the end is cheaper than a proprietary solution. So that's how we tackle our innovation. So to wrap up, and I have one minute and 34 seconds, so spot on time, I think there's an enormous energy challenge in the world with the growing population and, uh, and, and even if we max out on, on renewables, we still need to also max out on the other energy sources. That's a given. Technical innovation and IT-enabled innovation is absolutely key to make a difference, help to solve this problem, but also for us to compete. And then, um, and then yeah, in the end of the day, a lot of bites get into the barrel, as you've seen. 
the one maybe I should have put on this slide is back to where I at a certain point was. It's also, there's a lot of bites in the belt, but we need a lot of good talent to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Arjen Dorland. Thank you.